So finally the PCB is has, has arrived, as manufactured, and I have laid them out here in somewhat logical order. Let me go through them from the bottom to the top. At the bottom here we have the panel boards, and to explain what a panel is, I'll take in one of the 3D printed pieces that I have. This is the panel that would display a part of the data bus. And Behind this panel will sit the panel board like this. And the idea is that this is going to be mounted with the, with the bits and pieces that allow me to see and to modify the value of the data bus at any certain time. And to be able to see the data values, I of course have LEDs and to modify the values I have switches. So, if, let's say I solder these into place like this, then we can modify the values and see what they are. And then this is going on top, like this. So the switches come out on the top side. We have some spacing here, and I can push the LEDs up into place like this. So, so this is the panel board concept. It is this 50 by 50 millimeter 3D printed device that sits on top of a PCB that is also 50 by 50 millimeters, and the total front panel of the CP, of the computer is organized as six panels in this direction and three panels in this direction. And this row at the bottom here represents all the user interface panels that we have in the system. And these have different purposes. For instance, at, to the far right here, we have the data boards. Those, those make it possible to see, read and write, or see and display the values of a data bus. Here we have the address bus, to see and modify the value of the, of the current address. Here we have a status board. That status board displays uh, the clock. It displays the enemy and IRQ interrupt uh, status and also if there is an instruction fetch going on. And with this simple board I can read or uh, write data to certain specific addresses. And this somewhat more advanced thing is a CPU control board. It is possible to specify the CPU clock frequency by turning a knob here to run at this frequency or halt it. And if it's at halt, I can single step by pressing this button here, single step, single cycles, or I can single step, single instructions here, or I can reset the system here. So, those are the, the front panel interfaces, but they need to interface the computer somehow. And to these panel boards, there's a row of user interface boards. These are interface devices and in some senses control and logic devices to, to interface to the user interface bus. You can see the connector down here and here and here. This is a 2x36 pin bus that is visible on the motherboard over here. Because on the motherboard we have connectors of that shape and we have a mating connector, male connector here, that goes in like this. And from the user interface board, to mechanically relieve the connection to the bus, there is a flat cable going from the user interface board to the panel board, so that this can be mounted in a nice position at the front panel of the computer. So, um, then we have the motherboard, it's divided up into two parts, the proper mainboard or motherboard and the extended motherboard. And the reason why it's divided into two is that, well, it's mainly cost. It is expensive to make uh, such a long board, so I broke it up and had two, uh, a connector mating the two. And here is the main processor, the 65CO2, then we have two SRAM capsules over here with 32k each and there's some address decode logic over here and to the 
Uh, on the rear side we have another connector which is the backplane bus and that is connected with another cable to these mating connectors and this will actually sit on this in this vertical way and the other way around like this so this connect connector goes up here and on this backplane board there will be a number of backplane connectors representing the backplane bus and this is an example of a plug-in board with a mating connector like this that goes into the backplane bus in a vertical fashion like this. So that's the structure of the system. Okay, time to solder. Okay, the first one is finished. I don't think it's too shabby, even though you can see from a very long distance that this is hand soldered. Uh, so I'll we'll just do some quick power tests on it and then start with the next one. One down and 13 to go. mounted and ready to be test run. I made a couple of mistakes apparently but I think we can have a test run anyway. Uh, it comes out relatively nicely like that and these flat cables are reasonably well organized. It almost closes completely. The biggest reason why it there is a few millimeters short here is that I made a mistake when I designed this rather large board. It is too too tall so it actually uh, goes beyond the spacing that's allowed by these um, parts here. So I actually have to dig out some pieces of this one to actually accommodate the, the, this board here. So if I redo this board in the future, I probably will make it a little bit wider. This is uh, the CPU control board and it contains the clock generation and a few other features. So that's why it is relatively large. Okay, but let's try to have a go. Let's turn it on. Some reasonable current limits. It's alive! It currently draws uh, 0.8 amps and actually it's mostly the LEDs, the old fashioned LEDs which consume about 20 milliamps each that draw the most of the current. But now it seems like it's alive! So, let's try it out. 
This is a read function. Oh, it's not working. Ah, there's nothing wrong. Oh yes, I know what it is. I have not plugged in the backplane board and the address resolution yeah, of the backplane board is integrated into the address resol uh, resolvement over here. So I actually have to bypass this and patch a signal saying there is no plug-in board uh, plugged in that will uh, override the current address space. So, let, let me find a patch cable. Here are the drawings. Let's go to the main board. Here is the main board. And the signal we are looking for is the CDD signal. The CDD signal comes from the backplane cable, it's on pin uh, 11. It's currently undefined, so I will use this cable to pull it up to to a high high level, and then we'll try to read the memory address again. Power off. Pin. Ten was it? I happen to know that that is VCC on that connected there. No, it's still not working. Give me a minute. Alright, so I figured it out. Uh, it was this button that was stuck in a down position which prevented the clock from moving and uh, when the clock is uh, set to a low position it prevents some user memory accesses. Anyway, so now it works. Here it's uh, the power on state which is, which is completely random of course. Down here we have the run hold switch. So now it's running and this is the clock and this knob turns up and down the frequency now it, it is at 1 hertz and when this lamp blinks it, it fetches a new instruction and uh, 1 hertz is the default rate that it starts on uh, I can go down to even lower frequencies and this is the lowest frequency which is 1 quarter of a hertz but then I can also Increase the speed and now it really starts to look like a 70s sci fi movie, doesn't it? Anyway, I can increase it, it's increased by a factor of two in every step until we reach a point over here. Now it's running at full speed at 2 megahertz, but that's no fun, we don't see what happens, so let's go back to 1 hertz. Okay, so now it's in halt mode. This button here is uh, interrupt request. This is uh, non-maskable interrupt. This is clock cycle stepping. This is instruction stepping. This is reset. This is the address bus and this is the data bus. These two are read memory access and write memory access. When, when they're pushed up, they take the value that's put on the switches and hits that address and shows the data you know, on the LEDs over here. Uh, correspondingly, if I do a write, it takes the value from the switches and the values set on the data switches and stores that in, in this memory location. I can also push them down and that means read the next. That means it increments the value stored in the address register by one and displays that value. So for instance if I do this I now display the value of address 0 which is 8. Then I can press it down now it stores 
shows the value store at address 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and, and so on. And if I push it up, now it goes to what's set on the uh, address again. And then this works similarly. If I put these ones all up and I perform a write, it stores F0 on address 0. Then, can I, then I can uh, write that to the, uh, those four addresses that I just did. So now we can verify that at address 0 it, there is actually uh, F0 and I can read, read, read and it's still the same. When I go to the fourth address it, it shows some other value. Then I can single step like this. Now it shows the activity of of the address bus and the data bus as it's proceeding. And this is instruction stepping, which means that it, it it takes the clock frequency that I've set over here and continues the clock cycles until the next instruction is fetched. And there I could see that was probably three or four cycles in, in that instruction. I can continue like this until that one lights up and that instruction is now finished and the new one is about to operate. I can also push reset and if I now start to produce clock cycles it goes through the reset sequence and eventually here you see FFFC and FFFD and those two uh, values that sh was shown on the data bus is now the new program counter that is the reset vector. I can now step at that position and over here we have the interrupt request so if I flip that and do cycle stepping it starts to fetch it goes through the uh, interrupt sequence and starts to fetch the uh, interrupt vector and jumps to that address. Similarly, we can do the same thing for non-maskable interrupts.